Hey folks, this is Tim Wheaton with Calf Kick Sports, and we're so lucky today to have the back-to-back -back Olympic gold medalist and PFL champion in Kayla Harrison. Kayla, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time. How's everything in Coconut Creek, Florida today? Everything's good. I actually just got in from, I had training this morning, then I did a little, the kids are at um, camp this week, so I laid out for about an hour, got some sun. Everything's good. Getting ready to go to my next training session. Oh, I love it. How is the heat down in, down in Florida? Is everything it's okay? It's pretty hot. It's pretty hot. Uh, I had to jump, jump in the pool. So, but I oh. consider it like a recovery since it's a saltwater pool. So I'm like, all right, I'm doing a little recovery workout right now. Oh, that sounds awesome. So you're fighting <laughs> Gena Fabian at PFL eight on August 19th. Um, I want to ask you, how is training coming along? You're at the legendary, uh, American top teen Academy there. How's everything in training? Yeah. Training's been great. Um, you know, one of the great things about being at a gym like American Top Team is you always have training partners, no matter what the look is. Um, you know, Jenna is a very specific style. She's a tall southpaw striker. So um, if I was at another gym, that might be kind of hard to find. But here it's no problem. So <laughs> training's been going really good. So coming up on August 19th, you have the fight. Is there any bad blood? Is there any beef or is it just business as usual for you? No, I don't have any bad blood with anyone, to be honest. Um you know, yeah. We were supposed to fight in 2019, actually at the semifinals there, but she pulled out of the fight. So um, it's a, a match I've been preparing for for a while. I'm excited to, to finally get out there. And I think it's just going to be, um, you know, your very stereotypical classic striker versus grappler um, who's going to instill their will. Yep, absolutely. As you said, this turn, it's not a tournament. It's a coronation. That's what you said, right? Right. You got it. <laughs> um, this is just another step along the way. It's just another step along the way to the big giant paycheck. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that you, part I don't, I don't hate so much. That part's <laughs> nice. I, I also want to know, you do a lot of media. You do a huge amount of interviews. What interview questions are you absolutely sick of answering? Um, the Amanda questions those are kind of annoying just because i feel like uh the media is trying to create drama where there is none and ain't nobody got time for that <laughs> um that's pretty much it other than that i mean it's tough because i know you guys all have a job to do but but the questions get pretty repetitive after a while well, I, yeah, I, like I do my research and I was checking on interviews and yeah, the Amanda question and I feel like I've answered it. Like I, I get it. It's fine. I read it 55 <laughs> times getting ready for this, you know, <laughs> we, everyone knows like we're good there. <laughs> so you were the back to back gold medalist in 2012 and 2016. Absolutely surreal. Now you're doing mixed martial arts and won a PFL championship in 2019 and undefeated for training for these sports. What do you find more competitive? Um. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I think that MMA is harder for me just because I'm new. You know, I still consider myself a beginner in MMA, whereas I started judo when I was six years old. So by the time I got to Olympic level, I could hold my own with with kind of the best of them. Um, and I had trained my entire life to get to that moment. I've only been training MMA for three and a half years. So um, it's definitely harder days. Um, a lot of big learning curve, you know, I have a lot to learn still. I feel like every single session I'm learning something or correcting something, fixing something. So, um, but I like it like that, you know, it, it's way more fun for me to show up to work, um, and be tested and have to work on new stuff and figure it out and find a way than to, you know, I got to the point in judo where it was like, I was everything that I won with, I learned in the first six months of training and it was just the repetition of perfecting that thing over and over and over and over again which I do a lot of in MMA like don't get me wrong I have my very basic skill set and I'm just perfecting it but when I'm going live or I'm putting positions or I'm I'm training and certain things happen you know sometimes I'm like I don't know what the answer to that is and I get to figure it out that's fun it's like it's learning something new it's learning a new skill right so I yeah. won't ask you the Amanda question, but I'll ask you the other kind of hot topic question. Is there any YouTube stars that you want to beat up in a boxing room <laughs> for money? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I would beat anybody up for the right amount of money. <laughs> for the right amount of money. <laughs> That's a great answer. I love it. <laughs> uh, 
Um, a lot of fighters have their signature brand. Jorge Masvidal has his tequila. Conor McGregor has his whiskey. Dustin Poirier has his hot sauce. What would be the signature brand of Kayla Harrison? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, my light and funny answer would be probably like a biscuits and gravy. It's Ooh. my one of my favorite foods. Um, but the serious answer would probably be just my foundation. You know, I want my foundation to be my brand and my lasting legacy. Um, and I want to sort of making money is great, but I want to be the change in the world that I want to see. Oh, absolutely. So you have the fearless foundation is what we're talking about. And your book is also fighting back. Did you want to tell us a little bit more about these two? Sure. Yeah. So, um, the fearless foundation is for survivors of sexual abuse. I am a survivor of child sexual abuse myself. Um, and really, I could go on about it for days, but really the, the basis of the foundation is um, two things. One is mastery. So it's judo was my mastery. It was my thing that I did where I could kind of just be a kid again. Um, it could be painting. It could be archery. It could be knitting. It could be whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, so eventually I would like to have programs for kids like judo programs or archery programs or tennis programs, whatever it may be. Um, and then the second part, the biggest part that I've really been working on hard for the last few years is education. Um, I just feel like there's growing up, I remember there being all kinds of, you know, health class. We talked about safe sex and we talked about, um, stranger danger. And we talked about saying no to drugs. Um, but we never really talked about what you should do if someone close to you tries to take advantage of you. And I think that that is a big part of why. Um, child sexual abuse is still so prevalent is because we don't have those conversations. Those are kind of hard conversations to have with our kids. They're uncomfortable. It's it, no one really knows how it's kind of a taboo. So I wrote fighting back um, with two psychologists from McLean hospital and it uses my story as a guideline. Um, it, you know, it's my actual journal entries from the time of the abuse all the way through, you know, to my first Olympic gold medal and it talks about, you know, what is grooming? Um, what should you say to your child? How do you, how do you approach your child if you think something might be going on? Or how do you approach your child if you don't think something is going on and you just want to get to know what's going on in their world? Um, it talks about the court process and how to deal with that. And, and then also gives a little bit of hope. Um, you know, in my case, there is a shiny gold medal at the end of the tunnel. There is um, a rainbow. So yeah, that's pretty much the biggest piece for me right now. And the goal is to eventually have a curriculum for it so that it can be in the seventh grade health class. Um, and you do have to read it and learn about it and talk about it and sort of just start to have the conversation. I feel like we've come a long way as a society, just with like the Me Too, Too movement. And um, unfortunately, some of the big scandals that have happened, we've, we've started having the conversation, but we can't just talk about it. We have to figure out ways to fix it and, and to educate ourselves so that it doesn't continue to happen. No, oh, absolutely. And it's a great story. And it's a great book to check out as well. Now, one thing we always talk about, like, I remember Stranger Danger as well, but it's usually, typically, it's people close to you. And it's people that children oh, yeah. trust, oh, isn't it? Yeah, I, I believe my numbers could be wrong, but over 75% of cases are well known friends of the family, uncles, relatives, like the coach, the neighbor, the, you know, it's people that you know. Um, and that's a scary thing to think about as a parent, you know, it's terrifying, but it's also, unfortunately, it's important that we do think about it. Um, one of the best analogies I ever heard was, you know, you wouldn't give your, the keys to your car to someone and say, oh, here, you know, go take her for a spin or I trust you. So why would you ever just hand over your kids to a coach, to a tutor, to a, you know, whoever it may be? and say, here, make my kid the next Gabby Douglas, make my kid the next Michael Phelps, uh, make my kid a genius. Um, you know, we have to be really careful. Well, absolutely. And it's an amazing story. It's an inspirational story coming from what you came from to where you are now. And speaking of which, in the last year, you became a mother yourself. Has I did. being a mother changed kind of the fight game or the way you train or the way you think about the future in this sport? Um, no, I think it's just made me a better person. Um, you know, I think it's made me a better fighter. I think it's made me, um, complete if that makes sense. You know, I guess I didn't realize how selfish and self-absorbed 
my life was before I had the kids. You know, I would wake up, train, eat, lay out, sleep, repeat. Um, and now um, my life was really empty. And now it's not, you know, it's overflowing with um, some stress, but also just so much happiness and joy and um, getting to sort of, it's the biggest responsibility I've ever had and um, the scariest thing I've ever done, but watching them grow, watching them thrive, seeing their moments of um, success is so much better than any success I've ever had. It's, I mean, you, if you're a parent, any parent knows, like, it's just, there's nothing you can't, it's the hardest job in the world, but the most amazing rewarding job in the world, for sure. Just incredibly rewarding, right? What advice would you be giving to new parents? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm the right one to ask for advice. Um, I don't know. My biggest thing is there's no such thing as too much love. You know, obviously my kids, um, my, they're my niece and nephew, but Um, I'm in the process of adopting them now, but they came from a lot of trauma. Um, They've had really hard lives and I'm just a big believer in there's no such thing as too much love, you know? Um, It's, uh, it's tough because you want to be, you have to discipline them. You have to, you know, now I'm not the fun aunt anymore. I'm the (laughs) disciplinarian and the nurturer. Um, But I firmly believe that as long as they I have seen with my own eyes, watching them go from being um, scared, insecure, fears, uh, you know, having all of all of those things, a lot of trauma, a lot of uncertainty in their lives and watching me give them a safe, healthy, happy environment where they can trust that someone is always going to be there and someone is always going to love them no matter what. I've seen what that does to them and how that's changed them and how that's made them fearless and made them strong and made them proud and made them, um, you know, their own little people. And there's no such thing as too much love. I love it. That's wonderful to hear. I, I, it's hard to turn back into fighting now, but I wanted to ask you, coming into mixed <laughs> martial arts, who were your biggest inspirations into coming into the sport? <clears throat> um, Frankie Edgar was always a big inspiration to me. I loved watching him fight. Um, just always a dog in there, you know, no quit, no, never give up mentality. Yeah. Um, great champion as favorite. well. Yeah. Also super humble guy, great champion. I actually met him. Um, I didn't watch a ton of MMA when I was younger, but I met him at a, like a, uh, sponsor thing and he was so nice to me and I just couldn't, I was like this shy teenage girl, like, <sighs> I didn't know how to act. And he was just, I'll never forget. He was very kind to me. And that made me a fan kind of for life. It's crazy to think that you and him actually fight at the same weight class and you are I know. a fair <laughs> bit taller than him. Yeah. <laughs> I am a little bit bigger. Yeah. I would say I'm a bit bigger. <laughs> um, a couple more questions before I let you go here. What advice would you be giving to younger people who are looking to get into mixed martial arts? Um, hmm. I think you got to have a really strong, um, you have to have a lot of mental toughness to get into mixed martial arts, to get into any sport really. But I think especially um, in a sport where when you have a bad day, you're literally getting punched in the face. Um, So, you know, you have to have a a strong mental toughness, mental fortitude, and don't, don't be afraid to let failure be your fuel. If you really love it, if you're really truly passionate about it, if it's really what you want to do, you're going to take your licks. You're going to take your bumps. You're going to take your bruises. You're going to have failures and and bad days. And that's all part of the journey. And um, I would strongly encourage all of you youngins to embrace the grind and enjoy the journey because it goes by faster than you think. Oh, thanks so much for that. And now this is kind of asking the question that you understand. Without asking the question, five years from now, 10 years from now, where is Kayla Harrison in the MMA world? Oh, um, well, 10 years from now, she's retired. Retired. (laughs) Wonderful. She's gone. (laughs) Um, Well, five years from now, I'll probably, I mean, not probably, I'll I'll be considered the the greatest of all time, for sure. The greatest of all time. That's a great legacy to have. I, I love it. Okay, so you are fighting. August 19th in PFL against Fabian. This is in the tournament brackets. I'll give you the last word here. What else do we need to know? What else is going on? Where can we find more of you, Kayla? Um, You can find me on Instagram and Judo Kayla on Twitter at Kayla H. Um, 
be sure to check out my foundation, fearlessfoundation.org. If you want to donate right now, all of the donations that I receive up until my fight on August 19th are going to the survivors and victims of the Surfside building collapse. Um, so anything you can give, we they would appreciate, I'm sure. Um, and we here in Florida would appreciate as well. That's awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure.